Welcome to the Functional Medicine Radio Show with your host, Dr. Carrie Drizga, known internationally as the Functional Medicine Doc. Dr. Carrie is committed to helping patients find the root cause of their health problems and fixing the cause with natural treatments so they can feel normal again. Dr. Carey is the founder of Functional Medicine Ontario and is the author of the hit book, Reclaim Your Energy and Feel Normal Again. Please welcome your host, Dr. Carrie Drizga. Hello, everybody, and welcome to the Functional Medicine Radio Show, the only Internet radio show dedicated to giving you real solutions to improve your health. Not only are they real solutions, but they're natural solutions as well, because as you know, the one and only true wealth you have is your health. I'm your host, Dr. Kiri Drizga, the Functional Medicine Doc, and I'm committed to helping you find the root cause of your health problem, fix the cause with natural treatments so you can feel normal again and live your life to the fullest. Today's topic is, does your blood sugar impact your brain health? And is your blood sugar shrinking your brain? I'm so very excited about today's show because my special guest is Ralph Sanchez. Let me tell you a little about him. Ralph Sanchez is the author of The Diabetic Brain in Alzheimer's Disease, a book that connects the dots between type 2 diabetes, type 3 diabetes, and Alzheimer's disease. Ralph has spent nearly two decades in study to comprehend the risk factors and related causes of Alzheimer's disease and has extensively reviewed the neurological complexities and metabolic underpinnings that are linked to a diabetic brain in dementia and Alzheimer's. Ralph's passion is to enlighten others and to share his insights on the Alzheimer's pandemic that is drawn from his in-depth review of Alzheimer's research and how that body of science can be transformed into actionable steps for risk reduction and prevention. Ralph, thank you so much for being my special guest today on this episode of the Functional Medicine Radio Show. Well, it's a real delight, Dr. Carey. I thank you so much for inviting me and I'm Really looking forward to sharing some of that information you you alluded to in the introduction. So, Ralph, I think a good place to start is just your story about your, you know, how you had a concussion and exposure to pesticides and mercury and how that led you into this Alzheimer's journey. Well, yes, I won't go into it in great depth because there's so much to say about that, but I uh, was already in my integrative medicine practice, and one of the things that I incorporated into my practice was a paradigm referred to as functional medicine, which I know your listeners are probably very aware of because of your work. Yes. And in functional medicine, you know, one of the things that um, is really important is to look at the links between one thing or another and the underlying causes that may be driving a certain uh, malaise or disease pattern. And in my case, I just wasn't feeling good. And uh, and looking at the underlying reasons for all of that, and there were many, uh, one of the things that I started to realize in looking at the research and doing testing and whatnot was that I was at an increased risk for a neurological problem or disease pattern as I aged. I had a severe concussion. I almost uh, passed away from it in an auto accident when I was uh, about 20 years old. So it was um, a good uh, 20 years prior to me becoming more aware of what that could mean later on in life. Just one severe head trauma in one's history can raise the risk for a dementia or a neurological disease later in life. And uh, prior to my uh, getting into my work as a practitioner, I had a landscaping uh, business. And in that landscaping business, I was uh, rather ignorant and used pesticides rather liberally. I was a young man and just um, just dumb and uh, didn't protect myself. I didn't, uh, didn't really understand the uh, potential impact that had on my health. And uh, sure enough, I did have some issues related to that. And like I said, I just wasn't feeling well. So in looking for answers 
and putting two and two together as to why I didn't feel well, looking at my history, cause and effect, I started to realize, wow, this is a lot of um, uh, insult, as it's termed in our world, to my brain. Uh, between the trauma that I had when I was a younger man and the exposure to pesticides. And what I had learned and through my research was that uh, those pesticides and herbicides back in the um, 80s and 70s when I was doing that work, that was many years ago, they were actually laden with mercury. And that really um, um, turned on a light when I uh, read that because I thought, oh my God, this is part of my problem. And sure enough, when I did a um, medical challenge test, it's referred to, to look at uh, mercury body burdens, it's called a chelation test, I had mercury off the charts. And I wasn't eating a lot of fish and I didn't have a lot of amalgams which are linked to higher levels of uh, mercury. Um, and it was uh, definitely because of the work, the pesticides exposures and whatnot that were that had mercury in them as well too. And mercury is a very, very potent neurotoxin. And that was just another layer. So I was thinking, I really got to get very, very aggressive in terms of not only detoxing from a lot of those exposures, but supporting my brain health through nutrition and uh, lifestyle practices that are very, very important. Of course, being a practitioner and just passionate about health, I was already doing a lot of that, but I really got interested in the uh, Alzheimer's nutrition and the causes of it and whatnot. And uh, after a Jeffrey Bland seminar, of course, Jeffrey Bland is the father of functional medicine, and uh, he was my guru, of course. Uh, after one of his seminars, I was reading uh, some notes, and he referred to a genetic marker, uh, APOE4, and the 4 uh, designates the variant of APOE gene. And uh, he mentioned that uh, not only was it a marker for a risk for cardiovascular disease but for Alzheimer's disease and when I saw that that was around the year 1999 when I saw that I go oh my god that's amazing why isn't everybody talking about this now cardiologists were using that marker uh, quite a bit in more advanced um, cardiovascular risk assessments but uh, it was a, a well accepted marker and, and quite available but nobody was talking about it as a marker that one could look at for a person's risk for Alzheimer's disease later in life. So I really started to dig into the research at that point and started to learn all about APOE4 and other factors that are considered risk factors that raise your risk for Alzheimer's disease as you age. And I was just uh, totally captivated by all that information. Yeah, every time I've heard Dr. Jeffrey Bland speak, he's always um, bowled me over. He's just oh, yeah. an amazing <laughs> um, clinician, an amazing person, an amazing speaker. Yeah. And yeah. Um, and as you said, functional medicine is, it just makes sense when we're, especially when we're approaching these really complex illnesses and diseases like cognitive decline, dementia, Alzheimer's. I was very fortunate to be trained by Dr. Dale Bredesen in his protocol. Oh, yes, yes, And of um, I got to interview him for my podcast. So for the listeners out there, I will put that link in the podcast notes so you can listen to that in my interview with uh, Perlman and some of the other people. Great. But yeah. But yeah, so we know that cognitive decline is multifactorial. Right. So Ralph, you mentioned pesticides, mercury, concussion, and there's like 30 other things. <laughs> Yeah. Uh, above and beyond that, um, exactly. APOE4 testing is really important. And when I did my training with Dr. Bredesen, that was one of the first things. Like that same day, mm -hmm. I went online. I ordered a test kit from 23andMe. 
to have my genetics tested so I could see if I had that ApoE4 gene because Dr. Bredesen says if you have zero copies of the ApoE4 gene, your chances of developing Alzheimer's is about 9%. And if you uh-huh. have one copy of the ApoE4 gene, that's now a 30% chance of mm-hmm. developing Alzheimer's. And if you happen to have two copies of the gene, mm-hmm. that means you got one from your mom and one from your dad, that means you're at 50 to 90% chance of developing Alzheimer's. So our conversation is so vitally important, especially for people who have ApoE4, but also for people who don't have the genetic factors because there's about 30 other uh, metabolic issues that can contribute to cognitive cognitive decline. So Ralph, you wrote about type 3 diabetes and I think a lot of listeners don't know what that is. So can you explain what type 3 diabetes (coughs) is and why that's bad? Oh, absolutely. So in 2005, I was well into my research and starting to really understand all of the um, all of the issues related to what goes on in the brain in Alzheimer's disease and um, a research a study popped up that referred to problems in the brain with insulin and uh, they described other facets of, um, of the disease pattern related to insulin and um, other factors, and they said this really looks a lot like a diabetes of the brain. So they referred to it as a type 3 diabetes. It was the first time, 2005. And um, uh, the research started to uh, really uh, gather together in in terms of uh, what that meant and what that represented. And what that represents in the brain as a component to the disease process, and it's a very common component, and I'll go into that in a few minutes. But just like in type 2 diabetes, let's say the two major issues in type 2 diabetes is insulin resistance, and because of that, because you're not able to utilize insulin appropriately, you're not able to metabolize glucose or use glucose. You can't take it up into the cell, you can't burn it for energy, and that's why you have higher circulating levels of blood sugar. So between uh, insulin resistance and the problems with glucose metabolism, those are very central to type 2 diabetes. And the damage that results in type 2 diabetes is largely uh, centered around those two uh, biological phenomena. Now, in the brain there also is an insulin resistance that develops. Um, It's different. Insulin has a different function in the brain than it does in the body. In the brain, it's very, very critical in terms of how it works in memory and learning processes. At the synapse, the synapse is the connection between neurons or brain cells, And at that synapse, there's a multitude of receptors that uh, accept, you know, signals from different signaling agents. And in the brain, insulin functions as a signaling agent. So once it docks with the receptor, it sets off a cascade of events that are very, very important in memory and learning processes. And I describe all of that in great detail in the book. Well, all of that really captured my imagination as far as something that made sense to me. And um, I don't know why, but it just I just knew intuitively that this was going to be a major direction that the research was going to go in. And sure enough, it did. So type 3 diabetes, besides the insulin problem in the brain, which is an insulin resistance because the insulin receptors at those synapses become dysfunctional. They are not able to, you know, uh, accept the uh, signal from insulin. And so that becomes a real problem with 
a lot of other associated events that, again, are very important for memory and learning processes. Now, insulin has long been debated uh, as to its uh, role in uh, glucose utilization, taking it up into the cell in the brain. Uh, no question about that in the body, but in the brain for a long time they thought that that just wasn't happening in the brain at all. And um, now we know a lot more about that. So it does function to some extent to facilitate the utilization of glucose. So um, it is important in that aspect. But there is another uh, issue related to the utilization of glucose that actually is apart from the insulin function and is an issue like the APOE gene and APOE4 variant uh, that's related to glucose, what's called glucose metabolism, the ability to take up glucose and burn it for energy. Well, APOE4s are not able to do that as well. Now, that's well documented in the research. So that's one of the reasons, and there's many reasons, why APOE4 puts you at risk for Alzheimer's disease and what happens in the brain as a result of all of that. And one of the reasons is that when you're, um, when you're carrying these variants, when you're born with these variants, you don't uh, utilize glucose that effectively, and there's a term for that. The term is glucose hypometabolism, which just alludes to the fact that you're not able to utilize glucose and metabolize it that effectively. Now, that is critical. That is a really, really important component to the APOE4 problem. And it even can be uh, an aspect independently of APOE4 because our little energy factories and all our cells of mitochondria are really, really dependent on having a constant supply of energy sources like glucose. So if you're uh, an APOE4 carrier, uh, you do not burn a glucose that effectively as you age, that puts your brain at risk. And I have a couple of chapters in my book which I focus on just brain energy metabolism. We now know, the research is becoming very clear, that the very earliest stages of Alzheimer's disease that is asymptomatic, which means it doesn't have any symptoms associated with it, um, is linked to not only glucose hypometabolism, but issues in how your mitochondria, those little energy factories in our cells, uh, burn energy and just function overall. So the research clearly shows that those two aspects, glucose hypometabolism and mitochondrial dysfunction, actually are significant events that go on very early in the Alzheimer's disease trajectory. Because another thing that we've discovered over the past few years is that Alzheimer's has really... Um, uh, a longer trajectory than they knew many years ago, uh, that it, it, it really spans 20 to 30 years, and it could be even longer, where the process begins and starts to brew and morph into a more serious problem. And there are various stages. Now, I mentioned the preclinical stage, and that is where there are no symptoms. So if you're not aware of your risk factors and you're not working with a physician or a practitioner that understands this in terms of your history and your genetics, then this uh, all transpires without anybody being aware of it. And slowly your brain is uh, suffering and actually declining in its um, health and uh, functional capacity. And all of that really puts your brain at risk for Alzheimer's disease as you age. 
Now, there's another fascinating component to this that relates to women, which I found to be absolutely uh, fascinating when I uh, discovered it in my research. Now, in women, uh, glucose hypometabolism can be uh, an especially significant component to cognitive decline, the risk for cognitive decline and dementia as they age. And why? Because estrogen is extremely important in utilizing glucose for metabolism. So, in a sense, estrogen for women governs a lot of the glucose metabolism that is, um, that is, of course, very, very important in terms of what we talked about, not only in your body, but in your brain especially. So, in menopause, if you happen to be a woman that goes into a lower estrogen profile, uh, then you're not burning uh, glucose that effectively. And they've shown very clearly that women that fall into this pattern and don't have that pattern arrested through some sort of intervention, they are particularly at risk. And what happens is that the brain is starts to look for something to use for energy. And if your brain can't use glucose, then it wants to use fat because that is the next best thing. And in some cases, it's really the best thing to burn for energy metabolism in the brain. So in women, again, if you're not utilizing and able to, uh, to burn glucose, take up glucose uh, because of estrogen issues, uh, you start breaking down the fat in your brain. It's called the myelin. The myelin is a fatty substance that uh, envelops the projections. They're called axons in the uh, brain. And the myelin is uh, very, very important for the function of your brain cell overall. And you start breaking down that myelin as a woman if you're a low estrogen profile as you age because the brain, again, is trying to use something for energy metabolism. So there's a very simple solution to all of that. First, you need to be aware of the potential problem for yourself as a woman. But that's why... One of the reasons, I mean, the the fact that um, it's it's surfaced and become so popular is one reason for what I'm about to say. But uh, this is a very critical awareness and something that women should be really tuned into, and that is being able to go into a metabolic shift as they age from being dependent on glucose metabolism to incorporating more uh, fat metabolism and the generation of what are called ketones. And that whole phenomenon is referred to as ketogenesis. I don't know if you've had people talking on the show, but it's obviously become extremely popular in our world of health and approaches to uh, boosting mitochondrial function, energy metabolism, and uh, boosting your brain function as well, too, because your brain readily uses uh, fat and even produces ketones in the brain. Uh, so that's a very important aspect to be aware of. So, Ralph, when it comes to protecting our brain health, so you spoke about how... Um, we can have things happening and impacting our brain before we have any symptoms. So that's pre-symptomatic or pre-clinical. Mm -hmm. And really, that really starts in our 20s and 30s, right? Well, it can. Let, let's say that, uh, let's just say that for an, a person, uh, a timeline, a critical timeline, maybe 20 to 30 years. Now, one in 10 Americans will be diagnosed uh, with Alzheimer's after the age 65. And that will jump to three or, or more uh, by the age 80, uh, age of 80 years old. So let's imagine that uh, somebody is diagnosed with Alzheimer's at the age 67. 
And if we accept that uh, there was a 20 to 30 year timeline in that person, yes, that disease process could have happened in their late 30s, right? But it was starting. Uh, certain, yeah, that yeah, was starting. <clears throat> exactly. So th certain factors came together, and that started to really um, put that person into uh, a risk and a pattern in their brain that started to gradually develop as an Alzheimer's disease problem. So for our listeners out there that are in their 30s and 40s, this is really important. What you're doing now this is, is going to have an impact. And then if you're in your 50s and 60s, it's even more important. Oh, yeah. As a matter of fact, the research is uh, now becoming very, um, very proactive in stating that midlife is a very critical stage for people, to, for them to be not only aware, but to start taking control of these risk factors. And that's the beauty of all of this, is that while well, APOE4 and uh, estrogen and uh, insulin and many other factors are related to the risk for Alzheimer's disease, uh, my message in my book is that everybody uh, can control this. Now, we're talking about late onset Alzheimer's disease, and the greatest risk factor associated with late onset Alzheimer's disease is simply aging. Okay, so the longer you live, the more likely you are to get into a dementia and Alzheimer's problem. And let me just mention that there is an associated um, disease pattern. Uh, which is related to diabetes and heart disease, and that's what I talk about primarily in my book, uh, which is the two very, very common pandemics in our uh, country, the U.S. and around the world, of diabetes and heart disease. Those are the two most common issues that people will uh, you know, develop as they age that will put them at risk for Alzheimer's disease because those disease patterns will converge with a lot of other risk factors that you may have, whether it be genetics or uh, diet and lifestyle that go along with all of that, that start to converge together to really create problems for you. Now, I'm sure you've talked on your show about diabetes and heart disease and the associated issues of chronic inflammation and another phenomenon that's referred to as oxidative stress and oxidative stress is just a pattern that develops alongside with um, uh, chronic inflammation whereby if you don't have enough antioxidants to combat all of the free radicals that are generated with chronic inflammation and the disease patterns that are um, common as a person ages, then your body uh, is in an oxidative stress pattern. Again, because you don't have enough antioxidants, your body generates a lot of antioxidants. And here's where, again, diet is very important because you derive a lot of potent anti-inflammatory and antioxidant molecules from your diet. I have a second book that will be out soon. It's called The Improved Mind Diet. And my emphasis in The Improved Mind Diet is to really look at the foods that are so protective and why they're protective. That title came out of a couple of studies that coined the mind diet. And they saw that a certain dietary groups, certain food groups, dietary patterns rather, uh, were really uh, highly associated with a protective effect on your brain function and against Alzheimer's disease in particular. So, Ralph, one of the things that you mentioned about late onset Alzheimer's disease was the factor of aging. Yes. And so what I want our listeners to understand is you still have control over this issue, even though it's related to aging. So as we age, we have oxidative stress, as you were saying, Ralph. We yes, have, chronic, we have chronic issues inflammation with, and oxidative stress is a component to the aging process. Yeah, and then and, we also have issues with hormonal deficiency, testosterone in men, estrogen in women, 
growth hormone in everyone, <laughs> pregnant alone and virtually all um, Alzheimer's patients. And, um, and as you were saying, going back to diet and the effects of glucose and insulin resistance. So this all adds up over time. Yes, it sure does. And when we say aging, I don't want our listeners to think, well, yeah, the clock is ticking and I'm getting older. I can't do anything about that. When we say aging in this aspect, we mean that there are these different factors that you can control and you can improve on. Absolutely. And that's the whole message, yeah. you know, in my book. And actually, the message that a lot of the research is starting to really promote. Now, uh, the part of that that's really important is that um, there is no pharmaceutical solution. Uh, 99.6% of all the trials on one pharmaceutical and one drug or another and the attempt to arrest Alzheimer's disease has failed, and there's nothing on the horizon that uh, that offers any hope in that regard. Uh, although, in uh, research, they've shown some very promising approaches with, say, like stem cell therapy and whatnot. So, there will be solutions like that for people that already have been diagnosed with Alzheimer's uh, years from now. But the solution and the thing that I've been talking about for many years, the solution is pre present. It's prevention. And it's really understanding that uh, you have a risk for health issues as you age, whether it be diabetes or heart disease or Alzheimer's disease. And then uh, what I was uh, getting into is another form of um, uh uh, a, a disease pattern in the brain that's referred to as vascular dementia, which is a very common. Uh, my mother died of vascular dementia, and that's because she had um, a metabolic syndrome. And metabolic syndrome is an associated uh, pattern uh, to diabetes that includes, you know, insulin resistance and high blood pressure and elevations in cholesterol and triglycerides and uh, maybe obesity or being overweight. And um, while my mother wasn't extremely overweight, you know, she had a little belly fat. And that's another very important thing to be aware of is belly fat. Um, as you age, that becomes a uh, quite common scenario for people, um, either through lack of exercise or their diet dietary uh, patterns, you know, belly fat starts to, you know, take over. And if it's a significant, uh, well, that belly fat generates a lot of inflammation. And uh, there's been um, uh, several studies that have linked obesity and belly fat and that chronic inflammation pattern and other issues associated with it because, of course, um, insulin resistance can be a component to it. It can cause insulin resistance. Uh, that all starts to, again, converge together into increasing your risk for health issues. Now, if you're not as susceptible uh, to Alzheimer's as another person, say, with APOE4, then all of that can start to, uh, you know, turn into a vascular dementia you know, where you have poor blood flow and circulation to the brain and issues with um, mini strokes or even bigger strokes because of that. So heart disease and diabetes, because those two go hand in hand, can um, really raise your risk for vascular dementia. And that is separate from Alzheimer's disease. But because a lot of people have these chronic patterns for years and years and years, those two disease patterns can coexist and be termed mixed dementia. So you can have vascular dementia and you can have Alzheimer's if you live long enough because of all of that as well too. And that's part of the message in my book that really the two most important um, health issues that people need to be aware of that are easily controlled through lifestyle and 
dietary interventions and uh, healthy supplementation can be a very important aspect of all of that. But it starts to really make a huge difference in curbing the issues related to metabolic disease, diabetes, and insulin resistance, and cardiovascular disease, and hypertension. Those are the, mo- the major risk factors associated with brain problems as you age. Uh, Alzheimer's is associated with all of that. And so the more you have issues like that, the more at risk you are for Alzheimer's disease or vascular dementia. Ralph, you've already shared so much valuable information. And I know that we could go on for another hour talking about this. We're, yes. We just have a few minutes left. Is there sure. anything else that we've not spoken about that you think is important for our listeners to understand? Well, um, you know, in the improved mind diet, um, you know, it just becomes more and more important to look at um, how you can get healthier, you know, as you age. And I would say that um, there are several things that are really important to focus on, which are, you know, what we all know is, you know, eating a healthy diet and um, really focusing on exercise and other lifestyle patterns that really start to make a big difference in your health as you age. And food is a huge uh, part of that. One of the things that happens in diabetes because of the elevated blood sugar is a phenomenon referred to as a glycation. And by now, most people have seen references to A1C on, on, on uh, the television advertising another pharmaceutical. And A1C is a, a marker of glycation and one that doctors frequently use. It's um, also termed hemoglobin A1C. So A1C is what they're now referring to it as. And A1C is a a very important, uh, what what is referred to as a biomarker. So these markers that are available in various tests can really tell you a lot about your risk. And it's very, very important to work with somebody who are looking at these biomarkers Uh, with you as you age and A1C can be a very important one because it represents they will tell you it's more for looking at your blood sugar control and it's true it's used that way but it's a marker of glycation and glycation is a direct representation of how you age the more you glycate the faster you age diabetes can be seen as a very accelerated aging process and disease pattern associated with that. And it's largely due to glycation. And then glycation actually generates more toxic molecules that are called advanced glycation end products. So that's why your blood sugar is so important to be aware of because this is really critical as you age. And uh, the same issues with uh, glycation are also derived from food. So you can glycate uh, your food to the point where it becomes toxic to you. And that's particularly true of meats. Browning meats and cooking meats at high temperature where you really like that nice roasted browning effect or even the charring from grilling. Well, all of that uh, is actually pretty toxic for you. I hate to break it uh, to your uh, listeners out there because I know in certain areas of the country, I'm out in California, and out here everybody loves to grill. In the summer, they're doing grilling all the time. And I loved it as well when I was younger. But as you get older, those are the kinds of things you really want to start curbing. Because they actually, if you have other problems, uh, can start to, you know, um, become a mix, a stew of uh, insults to your body and brain that just frankly are not good for you as you age. Um, Now, the good news is that 
uh, grilling and browning your meats isn't going to kill you. It's just a issue that for some people, if they have diabetes, let's say, and heart disease, they might want to be more careful about that. And that's why slow cooking has become so popular because it's a much healthier approach to to eating foods like that, especially uh, with meats and whatnot. So that's an important aspect to be aware of, uh, A1C glycation, advanced glycation end products, and advanced glycation end products has an acronym that's called AGES. And it's appropriate, so appropriate, because um, the more you produce AGES in your body and through the foods that you uh, eat, uh, the faster you're going to age and the more susceptible you're going to be to certain uh, disease patterns. So eating a healthy, healthy foods to combat all of that is really important. Fruits and vegetables and in the improved mind diet, I go all, over all of that in great detail. So for the listeners out there, Ralph was uh, referring to the blood test called A1C or hemoglobin A1C, and you can easily have that measured. And ideally, you would want your levels at 5.4 or lower. Ralph, how can our listeners find out more about you? Well, thank you, uh, Carrie. Uh, my main website is the Alzheimer's Solution.com. And uh, we actually created a page for your listeners. And that's the Alzheimer's solution forward slash functional medicine. And on that page, there are a few things that uh, can introduce them to my work. I have a personal assessment uh, uh, intake form that I uh, developed that looks at a lot of these major risk factors. So it's good to know what your fasting blood sugar is and your A1C, if possible, before taking that uh, test. But we have a personal assessment test on there. And also, uh, I've, uh, I'm offering a discovery session if anybody wants to talk about their risk a little bit or something that concerns them. I have a complimentary discovery session where I can chat with them a tiny bit. And... Um, also, there is a, a link there, another box with the uh, opportunity to um, get into a uh, funnel for the book, The Diabetic Brain and Alzheimer's Disease, so they can uh, um, have access to that. Ralph, thank you so much for being my special guest today. This has been a great interview. Thank you, Dr. Carey. It's been a real honor to be on your show, and I thank you so much for inviting me. All right, that wraps up this very special episode of the Functional Medicine Radio Show with Ralph Sanchez. And I want to thank you, our listeners, for tuning in today. And I'd like to invite you back next time for another episode of the Functional Medicine Radio Show. As always, I'm your host, Dr. Carey Drizga, the Functional Medicine Doc. Have a great week, everyone. You've been listening to the Functional Medicine Radio Show with your host, Dr. Carrie Drizga, known internationally as the Functional Medicine Doc. Dr. Carrie is committed to helping patients find the root cause of their health problems and fixing the cause with natural treatments so they can feel normal again. Dr. Carrie is the founder of Functional Medicine Ontario and is the author of the hit book, Reclaim Your Energy and Feel Normal Again. Please tell your friends about the Functional Medicine Radio Show, and we'll see you next week with more from Dr. Carey.